Thank you very much for the opportunity. It's always a challenge having a talk after Dr. McDonald. Uh, big shoes to, to fill, but I'll uh, give it my best shot. And uh, thank you. Uh, thank you so much for the opportunity. As I was saying, it's always a challenge to have my presentation after Dr. McDonald, but we'll give it our best shot. So um, I work with our local nephrology group, um, North Anita Kidney Specialist. I've been in the area for about three years now, previously from South Anuta, where I'd been for about 10 years. So I'm going to talk a little bit today about viral infections on in the kidney. Um, those are my disclosures, and these are their questions. These are true-false questions. We'll just run through them. I don't think that there is an audience response system. Um, the first question is, defense mechanisms against viral infections are both innate and adaptive. The second question is, v clinical manifestations of viral disease may be both due to direct tissue invasion and bystander response from, uh, bystander by damage from immune response. And the third question is, progression to end-stage disease may occur in up to 25% of hepatitis B patients. And all those questions and the answers are true, as we'll see through the course of this presentation. So the objectives of this talk would be primarily to discuss pathogenesis, and we'll look a little bit at viral infection in general. We'll look at clinical features of viral infection, um, specifically focusing on hepatitis B, hepatitis C, and HIV. Um, there'll be one slide which will uh, talk briefly about uh, SARS-CoV, but not in uh, significant detail, and we'll men make mention of two other, one or two other viral diseases of importance. This is our statement that was made in 1960 by the Nobel Peace Prize winner for medicine, Peter Pessawar, um, and uh, described the virus as a piece of bad news wrapped in protein. And viruses are remarkably unique in my view. You know, they're some of the smallest and simplest life forms on Earth, and yet they evoke complex replication, evasion, and spread strategies. For the viruses to be successful, they need to balance their replication against limiting damaging host response for them to self-propagate. And these words have never been much more true than they are now when we think about the recent epidemics and pandemics. And as we can see, in the past century, most of the pandemics and epidemics were primarily viral, save for the Black Death and the Yersinia pestis, and most recently with SARS-CoV, and who knows what the next pandemic would be. I had put my money on that being another viral infection. Viral viruses have specific peculiarities. They are obligate intracellular parasites, uh, they replicate only in the host. They do not have any ribosomes within themselves that are necessary for protein translation, and they cannot generate ATP. And based on this, one would be hard-pressed to even describe viruses as living. But their methods of propagation, their methods of spread, and uh, their impact on morbidity and mortality in the human beings, as well as in plants and in animals, uh, definitely point towards the fact that these are vibrant living organisms. Viruses have specific potencies that enable their spread. Viruses that are most successful are primarily not significantly pathogenic to enable host cell survival. They're not strongly immunogenic to facilitate their spread. And viruses also demonstrate adaptation with mutation primarily an antigenic shift, which would occur within, in between species, and antigenic drift, which drives the, manifest, the manifestation of mutations that we see in viral diseases. And this adaptation leads to evolution of more intricate viruses. On the other hand, leads to evolution of more intricate host defenses. The mechanisms of injury that we look at when thinking about kidney disease uh, primarily are focused on two areas of the kidney, glomerulonephritis and tubulointerstitial nephritis. 
in the injury mechanisms in the glomerulus. These primarily are the cytopathic effect of the virus, which may be directly due to viral inv invasion, may also be due to host responses in the virus that lead to programmed cell death. They may be in situ immune complex formation, where the antibody binds to viral antigens on the glomerulus or circulating immune complex deposition within the glomerulus itself. Within the tubular interstitium, interstitial nephritis may present due to direct cytopathic effect or host inflammatory response and or the presence of viral proteins within the interstitium. So this gives us a sense of what the mechanisms of, of injury would be. And there is an initial entry of the viruses, which allows for the toll-like proteins, which are part of the cytokines, that lead to either programmed cell death or lead to cell de-differentiation de and subsequent cell death. These lead to pro production of chemokines and recruit the B cells and the T cells, leading to additional cytokine production and the various mechanisms of acute as well as chronic injury within the kidneys. These mechanisms of injury are the primary basis of the viral manifestations in kidney disease across the spectrum. So these are the viruses that we we'll look at, primarily hepatitis B, hepatitis C, HIV, and we'll talk a bit about the SARS-CoV. Hepatitis B-associated renal disease most commonly would present with either membranous nephropathy or immune complex mediated nephropathy. There are instances of polyarteritis nodosum as a manifestation of renal disease, although these are rare. Membranous nephropathy is indistinguishable from uh, idiopathic membranous nephropathy, and their pathological hallmark of this disease is subepithelial immune complex deposits. In this condition, the actual antigen is part of hepatitis B surface core or, or envelope antigen. Most patients would present with overt liver disease. Um, at presentation, uh, most of the patients would have hypertension in association with their decreased GFR, and end-stage renal disease progression occurs in about 25 to 35% of patients who present with hepatitis B-associated renal disease. Membranous, membranoproliferated glomerulonephritis may also be seen with a characteristic histological pattern of basement membrane splitting as well as subendothelial deposits. The antigen in this case is primarily the hepatitis B surface antigen. Uh, these patients would present either with nephritic syndrome, which would be hypertension, edema, as well as an active urine sediment, or may present with overt nephrotic proteinuria. Um, typically, these patients would have low complements as a reflection of immune complex deposition or activation and may have manifestations of mixed cryoglobulinemia, predominantly type 3, and we'll talk about this a little bit later. The optimal treatment in these instances is unclear, um, specifically when we think about hepatitis B-associated renal disease. However, the antiviral th therapy approaches include entacavir as well as tenofovir. Uh, lamivudin had been used, and in some areas still is used, but the, rem the problem with lami lamivudin is increased resistance due to the mutation of the hepatitis B, but it's very effective in remission of viremia and resolution of membranous nephropathy, up to 80% of those individuals. Um, the role of uh, pegylated interferon is much less currently, and the role of steroids may be present only in patients who present with rapidly progressive glomerulonephritis or polyarteritis nodosum. The balance there is the risk for reactivation or progression of severe disease, even with concomitant antivirals. Additional hepatitis B-associated lesions include polyarteritis nodosum. These patients tend to be sicker in presentation. They tend to have a lot of gastrointestinal involvement because they're at the mid 
size to large arteries involved are primarily mesenteric, more than the renal artery. In patients who have hepatitis B with acute kidney injury from polyarteritis nodosum, this is primarily due to renal ischemia and infarction and not due to glomerulonephritis. Other associated lesions include IgA nephropathy as well as focal and segmental glomerulosclerosis. Hepatitis C is the second viral disease that we'll focus on. This is a, a chronic problem or chronic um, um, prevalence in the United States. About three million individuals have chronic viremia. The landscape of uh, hepatitis C is certainly changing with the advent of the direct anti acting antivirals. The classic hallmark of hepatitis C associated renal disease is type one membranoproliferative glomerulonephritis, which we'll discuss. Um, and this is driven by immune complex deposition. Um, glomerulonephritis as a cause of acute kidney injury though is rare, less than 10%. Most of patients who have hepatitis C present with acute kidney injury due to other causes, um, acute tubular necrosis, hepatorenal syndrome or hepatorenal physiology, prerenal azotemia or chronic kidney disease, largely associated with diabetes. The different types of hepatitis C associated renal disease include cryoglobinemic glomerulonephritis, membranous nephropathy, polyarteritis nodosum, as well as immunotactive or fib fibrally glomerulonephritis. The last two are less common, and the first two tend to present most, with most of the bulk of the patients who have renal presentation. So this is just our demonstration of the affinity of the hepatitis C virus to the B cell. And the hepatitis C virus has trophism for the B cell, leads to B cell dysregulation. Um, this B cell dysregulation leads to clonal expansion of the B cells, as well as stimulation of antibody formation, which may lead to either autoimmune disorders, uh, may lead to presence of paraproteinemias with or without manifestations, or may lead to direct viral replication, cytokines and immune responses leading to uh, a renal injury. In six to eight percent of patients who have chronic hepatitis C infection, there may be predisposition towards B cell lymphomas. So as we stated there, hepatitis C virus has unique lymphotropism for the B cells, and it initially stimulates a poly polyclonal type three cryoglobulin, which subsequently develops to a monoclonal type two cryoglobulin. Their unique aspect of the monoclonal type 2 cryoglobulin is that it exhibits rheumatoid factor activity and it's IgM and the IgM uh, cryoglobulin is large it's a pentamer so five uh, five five segments of their of the IgM uh, uh, cryoglobulin and when it's bound to IgG either IgG 1 or 2 um, it forms a cryoglobulin complex, which is an even bigger uh, mo molecule. And this size, as well as immunogenicity of this molecule, leads to the manifestations that you see with cryoglobulinemia. In patients who have cryoglobulinemia and hepatitis C, in about five to 10 years, um, 30 to 35% develop type three mixed cryoglobulinemia. This manifestation is less likely associated with kidney disease. In 10 to 15 years, 10% progress to develop type two mixed cryoglobinemia with systemic vasculitis. And those are the patients who would present either with nephritic or nephrotic syndrome. The clinical presentation is variable. Um, patients who have type three mixed cryoglobinemia may present just with asymptomatic hematuria or uh, subnephrotic proteinuria. In patients who have florid cryoglobinemia, nephrotic syndrome or rapidly progressive glomerulonephritis may be seen. Um, the hallmark of this infection is uh, C3 hypochromatemia due to activation of their alternate, alternate immune uh, pathway. Sometimes you may see C3 hypochromatemia, but this is not uniform because the C3 also manifests as an acute phase reactant. So the levels may go up in hepatitis C. 
Most of these patients are rheumatoid factor positive, and that's primarily because of their uh, type 2 uh, mixed cryoglobinemia with uh, IgM kappa binding their IgG 1 and 3. Uh, patients may also have AST and ALT elevations, and upon performance of their electrophoresis, you will see presence of IgM kappa as well as polyclonal IgG. This is a manifestation of their infection and subsequent immune complex activation. And you can see there, there's an initial infection with the hepatitis C, and it will stimulate the IgG, which will bind to the viral compl complexes. The other route would be stimulation of the B cells, and subsequently the IgM, kappa. And when these bind together, we have their cryoglobinemic complex stimulate the alternate pathway with consumption of C4, and therefore the hallmark of this presentation tends to be C4 hypocomplementemia. There may be some consumption of C3, but this is balanced against the acute phase reactant, which increases the C3 itself. Um, and then the terminal process of this would end up being the membrane attack complex, as well as cytokine-associated injury to the cells within the renal tubules. This is an alternate way of describing hepatitis C-associated renal disease, either as cryoglobinemic or non-cryoglobinemic. Um, hepatitis C type 2 associated mixed cryoglobinemia is associated with about a 6% chance of B-cell lymphoma due to their uh, clonal expansion of the B-cells. Uh, it's also a risk factor for cardiovascular death due to coronary vasculitis, um, and as we had stated, upon widespread availability of the direct-acting antiretrovirals, this landscape will be rewritten. The treatments are primarily antiviral therapy, which hopefully will become widespread. In patients who present with acute cryoglobinemic disease, use of B-cell depletion therapy, as well as nonspecific immune suppressive therapy, such as steroids, may be employed. Uh, this is certainly balanced against the risk for widespread dissemination of hepatitis C. Um, in patients who have hepatitis C without significant renal manifestations, it's a reasonable recommendation to screen annually for hematuria and albuminuria, as well as hypertension, um, with the possibility of screening also for cryoglobinemia and complements. In patients who have hepatitis C, as well as renal manifestations, one biopsy series uh, showed that majority of the patients end up having diabetes in that series. Their second largest group had presence of membrane or proliferative GN and some contribution with interstitial nephritis. So the importance of doing our biopsy in patients who present with hepatitis C related kidney disease is really exemplified by this uh, diagram. And sometimes we think it is the hepatitis C, and it turns out to be the most common cause of uh, kidney disease in the US, which is diabetes. And we'll talk about HIV-associated renal disease. Their first two, um, sorry. So the first two conditions are much less seen in modern times because of their widespread availability of antiretroviral therapy. Especially in the US, it's exceedingly rare to find these conditions in patients who are on combined antiretroviral therapy with adequately suppressed uh, viral load and increased CD4. The third condition was previously known as HIVIC, currently just referred to as immune complex disease associated with HIV infection, has been a more common presentation recently, and combined antiretroviral treatment therapy is associated with additional um, renal manifestations, which we tend to see a little bit more commonly. Um, HIV-associated renal disease has evolved due to the availability of antiretroviral therapy. 
it's still unclear how HIV affects the kidneys because there is not their typical binding protein on their kidney cells. So their cells within the glomerulus, the cells within the tubules, lack the classical receptors for HIV. So that's still something that is uh, under investigation. Um, the renal manifestations depend on the treatment status with the antiretroviral therapies, as well as whether the patient is co-infected with hepatitis B or hepatitis C. Um, the genetic risk from apolipoprotein 1 is primarily seen in HIV-associated nephropathy, which is not commonly uh, seen in patients who are already on antiretroviral treatment. Patients who have HIV may also present with um, acute kidney injury or a drop in their GFR due to other circumstances aside from the viral infection. Medications are, medication effects are common. In patients who have HIV, more likelihood of being on pentamidine or acyclovir, potentially more likelihood of being on aminoglycosides. Um, there are changes in tubular creatinine handling, as Dr. McDonald noted, with uh, their trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole. In addition, one of the most commonly used medications for HIV has a component which is a sorry, which is the Corbistat, and Corbistat has a similar effect as trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole, and it blocks the tubular secretion of creatinine. So it does not affect the GFR per se, but the creatinine level would go up. Interstitial nephritis may be seen um, due to primar, primar, primary infections such as a BK virus or HIV, and this may also be seen in patients who have immune reconstitution sy syndrome. Um, it's important to keep in mind the limitations of their serum creatinine-based GFR estimates in patients who have HIV, especially if patients are chronically ill or have decreased muscle mass, as those are e equations will certainly underestimate the true kidney function. Medications used in the treatment of HIV may also be associated with their, their kidney disease, most commonly, the medications that we are seeing are tenofovir, and you can see that that affects both the proximal tubular injury, proximal tube, as well as uh, chronic injury from interstitial nephritis. Um, you may also have crystal nephropathy, which is rare these days. In the past, when the protease inhibitors were first uh, on the market, indinavir was the first protease inhibitor to be used. And it was, it's largely secreted and changed through their kidneys. And um, most of the patients ended up having crystal nephropathy from this medication. Uh, due to its side effects, as well as lack of efficacy, it's no longer used as frequently as uh, it was in the past. But atazanavir is a common a protease inhibitor still in use, and you may see incidences of crystal nephropathy in this case. So tenofovir is probably the most discussed antiretroviral that has kidney um, manifestations of disease or toxic kidney manifestations. And tenofovir, their initial molecule is uh, not absorbed within their GI tract. And this was their, their next iteration of this mod molecule was a tenofovir disopril fumarate. And this was absorbed through the GI tract with large or high concentration in the plasma. This allowed for greater penetration into the tubules um, within the kidney cells, as well as greater penetration into the HIV target cells. Unfortunately, the tenofovir is primarily uh, GFR, the secretion is GFR dependent. And if the kidney function drops for any reason, then the tenofovir becomes secreted through the tubules. And when that happens, there's damage within the my mitochondria and patients present with proximal tubular injury, which, which will present as acquired Fanconi syndrome. So presence of glucosuria, presence of uh, phosphaturia and uricosuria, as well as metabolic acidosis. The tenofovir molecule also inhibits their water handling in the kidneys, and patients present with acquired diabetes insipidus. In order to circumvent this uh, 
impact on the kidney, a newer molecule, which is the alephenamide, uh, was, uh, was uh, engineered. And this molecule is, is absorbed as a prodrug, even within their plasma, and therefore has little or lower concentrations within the plasma, which reflect lower concentrations within the tubules and less kidney damage. HIV-associated immune complex disease has become more prevalent due to higher antiretroviral use, presence of lower viral loads, as well as higher CD4 counts. It's less likely to, to progress to end-stage renal disease. Um, it's unclear whether there is a single antigen or IgG subtype or a pattern of glomerular deposition. Most of the biopsies primarily show presence of acute or chronic interstitial nephritis. And this just primarily looks at their uh, pathogenesis of their immune complex disease. You have polyclonal activation or HIV immune, con immune con reconstitution syndrome with present presentation of, of immune complexes. And these immune complexes would either be deposited in situ within the glomerulus or would be in the circulation, bind to antibodies, and subsequently deposit in the glomerulus, leading to glomerular injury. HIV-related thrombotic microangiopathy is rare with uh, the advent of combined antiretroviral therapy. Um, their presentation primarily was rapid onset of acute kidney injury with proteinuria, hematuria, as well as thrombocytopenia and hemolytic anemia. Challenging treatment approaches um, due to their use of largely immunosuppressive medications in the setting of widespread or in the setting of uncontrolled HIV. Uh, but thankfully, this is not something that we see very commonly. Um, currently, HIV is a manageable chronic disease for the most part. Um, there's increased risk for kidney dysfunction due to acute HIV unrelated illnesses, um, opportunistic infections, as well as unrelated glomerular diseases. Kidney biopsy is often, often helpful. And in patients who present with active urine sediment without any other explanation in the setting of HIV, then there should be a low threshold to pursue a kidney biopsy. So in patients who are HIV positive with renal disease, um, one approach is using their uh, presence or absence of chronic or combined antiretroviral therapy as our backbone. And in patients who are antiretroviral therapy naive of African heritage or who have nephrotic syndrome, then this is likely going to be HIV-associated nephropathy or HIVAN. Patients who are on combined antiretroviral therapy and who have nephrotic syndrome, then it's likely to be other glomerular diseases, potentially diabetic nephropathy or focal and segmental glomerulosclerosis. Patients who are on combined antiretroviral therapy with active urine sediment with or without low complements would, would be likely to have immune complex disease. And patients who are on combined antiretroviral therapy with subneprotic proteinuria as well as CKD with or without Fanconi syndrome would think about combined antiretroviral nephropathy. So finally, we'll talk a little bit about SARS-CoV and this is just two slides. Certainly an evolving body of knowledge uh, there are patients who have acute kidney injury may have this due to ischemia from hypoperfusion as well as thrombosis. Um, some of the biopsy series that have been done so far show a prevalence of collapsing glomerulopathy, which has coined their term COVID or COVID associated nephropathy. There are emerging uh, scientific suggestions that suggest the role of the apolipoprotein 1, um, which is also seen previously in HIV, an increased risk of HIV-associated nephropathy. Uh, there's, uh, there are also questions about their direct viral involvement, although their biopsy series have been variable as to whether viral particles are always elucidated in the biopsy. And then immune complex-associated injury and cytokine injury. This just gives you a 
brief structure of what would cause a drop in kidney function in patients who have um, severe COVID-19. And I think one area of one area of interest is iatrogenic. And um, the, this could primarily be related to medications. You know, the question about whether medications such as the remdesivir may be associated with lower kidney function. Um, uh, iatrogenic from the other medications that are usually used in patients who present with severe infection. There's also the question about the coagulopathy as well as microscopic uh, thrombotic processes that may occur as part of their coagulopathy that is seen in severe disease. And then finally, uh, this slide, uh, I put it up primarily because of the last uh, virus, and that's a dengue fever. And while dengue fever is not a very common uh, infection that you'd see in the United States, 40%, at least 40% of the world population live in areas that are endemic of this virus. And as luck may have it, some of those areas are areas that, you know, that are very vacation. Sorry. That are very um, vacation friendly. So in, there are patients who I have seen who have had dengue fever and associated uh, renal disease have come back from vacation either from you know, Southeast Asia or from uh, South America or Southern America. And it's just something to keep in mind when you see patients who present after travel with uh, acute kidney injury, especially if associated with hemolysis, uh, hemoglobinemia, and rhabdomyolysis. Thank you. Any questions? Maybe it's a little early to tell. Uh, these uh, SARS patients, uh, COVID patients that end up on dialysis, how do they do? Um, are they getting off of dialysis? Is, is their uh, kidney function returning to normal? Uh, well, in my experience, the patients in whom dialysis is required in the hospital, typically 90% tend to have an adverse outcome and don't make it out of the hospital. The patients who do, I've not had any patients who have has come to the units that I take care of who have had SARS-CoV required dialysis in the hospital and then left the hospital on dialysis. So a lot of the times they recover, they recover, including a re recovery of renal function. I don't know whether that has been the same for you, Ryan. Yeah, uh, if, if they were still on dialysis, they don't leave the hospital. If they made it off dialysis, then they typically recovered and, and went back home. So, but I've never seen somebody go on dialysis and then remain on dialysis and leave the hospital requiring home dialysis. I haven't seen that. I think the, the other um, interesting aspect is that the limitations of doing biopsies in their hospital when you have a patient who is that severely ill. And it's you know, primarily driven by, you know, prior to widespread vaccination, those staff exposure, and then patients being critically ill, the risk of bleeding. Most of those patients are on you know, anticoagulation. Most of those patients are you know, on, their, on the ventilator and prone or not prone. So the logistics of doing a kidney biopsy in their hospital with these patients is somewhat challenging. There have been some, one, at least one series where they had some patients who had biopsies done as an outpatient who presented with uh, SARS-CoV and either had new onset proteinuria or new onset hematuria and had biopsies. And uh, their, their, their results of those have shown either activation or reactivation of some immune complex type diseases, maybe minimal change. We've had some patients who have had anchor related disease that reactivates. Um, and uh, there has been, have been patients who just present with interstitial nephritis on the biopsy. But it's such a limited sample, and I don't know whether we can be able to draw any conclusions from that. Thank you.